Hello and uh, welcome back to Crossroads. Today we are going to see another one of those important choices we need to make. Perhaps you are at a crossroad and perhaps you are wondering about some of the things that we are going to be discussing this evening. Uh, a few weeks back we uh, were talking about making right choices and this is something related to that but a very important choice that we every one of us need to be making. So I have entitled this talk as the broad way or the narrow way. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13 to 14 it says enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. So it talks about a narrow gate and a broad gate. And there are few destinations that these two gates lead to. It's talking about that as well. If you have to categorize these as choices, well there are certain choices which are simple choices in life. There are some serious choices in life. For example, whether to eat dosa or idli is a, is a simple choice. I mean, it doesn't affect you much. Whether to wear a, a sneaker or uh, whether to wear formal shoes is not a very important or a serious choice in life. But it's a very simple one, but nevertheless, it's a choice. But there are some serious choices in life that you make as well. Like, for example, Choosing your life partner is a serious choice that you need to make and you need to be clear with that. You can't make a mistake on that. There are some choices like that. And then choices can be divided into good choices and bad choices based on the results that it produces. In the same way, there are some other choices that we make. There are some which are temporal. We were talking about that uh, last week. We were talking about worldliness and godliness. Worldly people think about things that pertain to the world. Godly people think about God and His purposes and plans for their life. So all the things, the choices that pertain to this world could be categorized as temporal. I mean, they are passing away. They are not of eternal consequences. Like for example, the food you eat, the clothes you wear, and the bike or the car you drive, these are all temporal things. And uh, those are some some of those temporal choices that you make. But there are some eternal choices as well, choices that have eternal consequences. Well, almost all religions, or rather many religions in the world, believe that there is a life after death as well. Something that you call as eternal, a never-ending kind of a, a life. And those are some of those choices that we need to make here on earth as well. The first human beings that God created, Adam and Eve, were placed in this beautiful garden of Eden. And God had created beautiful trees and fruits and flowers and everything was there for these two people to enjoy. And God said, you can eat of all the trees in this garden of Eden except one tree, which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God had told them not to touch the fruit of that tree. And yet you find that Mankind always struggles with these restrictions. I mean, if you are restricted from doing something, that's exactly what you want to experiment or uh, that's exactly what you want to do. And to see what happens if you ended up doing that. I think that's the same problem that the first human beings faced as well. They were deceived by the, by the devil, of course. But still, the choice was theirs, whether they would listen to God or whether they would listen to the devil. And therefore, Adam and Eve ended up listening to the devil and uh, finally did taste that fruit which was forbidden from them. And they ended up sinning against God. Simple disobedience, which had some serious consequences. So they did make a choice. And the choice that Adam and Eve made had an eternal consequence. Of course, the immediate punishment that they had was that they were sent out of the Garden of Eden, this beautiful garden that God had created for mankind. Well, it must have been a painful thing for them to be sent away from that garden. I mean, you know, there are situations in real life. For example, if you were in school, sometimes some teachers would, would simply say, I mean, if you have not done your homework, you get out of my class. I mean, it's such a humiliating thing. And uh, people feel so ashamed to be sent out of class. There are some guys who wouldn't probably bother about something like that. But most people would be, I mean, would be really upset about something like that. 
they would feel sorry for that, for being sent out. So this is a huge thing, Adam and Eve being sent out of the Garden of Eden, but much bigger was this problem of being separated from God. The God who created human beings wanted to have communion with us. He wanted to converse and in fact that is what he was doing every day with Adam and Eve. He would come at a particular time of the day and he would speak to them and he would commune with them. I mean he would talk with them. And so what had happened was man, mankind lost out on this relationship with God. One of the things that God had warned Adam and Eve about uh, eating that fruit was he said on the day that you eat this fruit you will surely die and yet the devil put uh, doubts in their mind about the statement that God had made so the consequence of transgressing God's laws the consequence of disobeying God was he said you will surely die death was the was the result of sin well death in the physical sense perhaps when God created the human beings for the first time, maybe there was no concept of death. He wanted to commune with them for everlasting time. But because sin entered the human race, God thought man should not be living in the same state of fallenness or in the sinful state forever. And therefore death came into the world, physical death. But not only physical death, because Adam and Eve took some time, I mean like it was not immediately that they died, they lived for another few hundred years and it was only after that that they died. But apart from the physical death, there was something else that came in as a result of sin, which was spiritual death. Or maybe in the long run, eternal separation from God because of sin. So it was a serious choice. It was a choice that had eternal consequences. The choice that Adam and Eve made. It was a bad choice. And it affected the entire human race. Because of which, later on in the book of Romans, it says, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, it says, All have sinned and fallen short of God's standards. Because of the first human beings, Adam and Eve, sinning, sin entered the entire human race. After that, every human being born in this world, no matter who you are, you are born with a sinful nature. This is like a common problem that all mankind faces, no matter who you are. You could be a Christian, or perhaps you could be born in a Christian home, that's what I mean. You could even be born in a Christian home, you could be the fourth generation Christian. But if you don't, relationship with God is not restored, if you continue to live in sin, there is no hope for you. All have sinned and fallen short of God's standards. Well. Sometimes people compare themselves with other human beings and they see and probably they say, I am better than him, I am better than her. But over here, the verse that uh, tells us over here is, it says, all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's standards. There's no one righteous. We all have sinned. I, for example, I mean like I was born in a Christian home. We are like fourth generation Christians. My father was a pastor. I was born in a pastor's home. It didn't make me righteous or holy just because I was born in a pastor's home. I grew up in the church. I went to church every Sunday. I did a lot of stuff. I mean, like I played music, I sang in church choirs. But I did not have a personal relationship with Jesus because I had fallen short of God's standards. I was born with a sinful nature and I had committed things that may have grieved God. So it was only when I was 18 years old that I was able to realize that I was a sinner and that I needed a savior and that I had to make a choice if I had to get to a place called heaven. I mean, most religions, once again, believe in these things called heaven and hell. The Bible talks very much, I mean, it talks a lot about uh, these two places, heaven and hell. Jesus very often mentions these things. So, over here, the Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the human predicament. All of us have sinned. And we have fallen short, God's, not of uh, your fellow human being's standards, but you have fallen short of God's standards. What are God's standards? God expects us to lead a holy life. God expects us to do what he, ex what he has instructed us to do. And if we have failed to do that, if we have disobeyed his voice and everything that is said in the Bible, in his word, we have fallen short of his standards. And therefore, we need to, we need to patch up 
as some would say. We need to restore that relationship with God. So from this situation of total depravity, I mean, we are totally lost, I mean, with, with, without God. We have lost this relationship with God. From this situation, we need to get back and restore that relationship with God. So the second thing that leads, to, leads me to this second thing called the consequence of sin. I mean, what is the consequence? Okay, you're telling, telling me that all of us have sinned. So what? Someone might ask. When I was doing my post-graduation studies in uh, New Testament, I had a professor who would often ask this question. So what? I mean, you couldn't escape that question with him. If you wrote research papers or perhaps if you were presenting uh, a paper in class, the first question that he will corner you with is this question, so what? Any statement you make, he would ask you this question, so what? Well, it was difficult in the, uh, when I was facing him for the first few times, but then I learned why he was asking this question. That was his favorite question. I mean, to check if you gave convincing answers, he would ask that question, so what? Okay, you're making a statement in your paper, in your research paper, so what? Explain yourself. Are you giving me convincing answers or is it just that you have lifted off this statement from some book and some author and you're just quoting it in your research paper? You need to be giving valid reasons as to why you're making this statement. That was the reason why he would ask the question, so what if this is the statement? I mean, so for example, if I'm telling you that all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's standards, someone might ask, so what if I have sinned? I don't care. So what if I've fallen short of God's standards? I don't care. Well, it's not that easy a statement or that easy a choice for you to be saying, so what, I don't care kind of a thing because sin has a consequence. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 in the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. Well, there's a wage that you need to be paying. There is a consequence of sin. There is a punishment and a penalty for sin and none of us can escape that. So the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Well, you might say like everyone dies. Everyone who is born in this world dies. So what? Well, let me tell you that yes, of course, everyone who is born in this world dies. But there is this thing called a life after death as well. And the question is, where would you spend your eternity? Like I said, many religions in this world believe about these two places called heaven and hell. Someone might call that as, as uh, moksha or, uh, or bliss or whatever else that they would call that as. And there's another place where evil people end up in, a place called hell. The Bible describes that place as a very scary place, a place where the fires don't die down, a place where, which is of no return. I mean, you can't get back, get yourself out of that place. And another place, the Bible says it's a bottomless pit. And it's going to be a place of such pain and such agony. There is no end to that pain and agony. But the Bible also explains heaven to be a place where, the, where there is no more tears, there is no more sorrow, there's no more struggles and hardships. But it is the dwelling place of God. There are these two places. So the question is, where will you spend your eternity after your life here on this earth? For those of us who think, okay, I like to enjoy this life on this earth, let's, let me just think about this life right now. The Bible tells us that life on this earth is very short, perhaps 70 years or maybe 80 years, but everyone will die one day. And if you have to decide where you will spend your eternity, it has to be a choice that needs to be made right now while you are alive. So, if you have to escape those consequences, which is death, a penalty has to be paid. And then the verse goes on to say, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there is a way out. That's what the Bible says. So how do we get out of that consequence? How do we um, uh, face this trouble of... Uh, uh, death being the consequence of sin. 
Well, the Bible clearly tells us that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus Christ, why are we talking about Him? Well, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Why are we even talking about Jesus Christ? Earlier on, we read a, read a verse in Matthew chapter 7, 7 and verse 13 to, 13 to 14. It says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who take that route, but narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life and there are few who find it. Elsewhere in the Bible, in John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus claims and he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no one in this world who has made such unique claims like Jesus did. There are many ways. There's a, there's a way that is so broad and many thousands of people take that way that leads to destruction, that leads to evil things of this world. And then the Bible also says there is a narrow way that leads to eternal life. And Jesus claims to be saying, I am the way, the truth and the life. If you have to enter eternal life in heaven, he seems to be saying, Jesus says, I am the way. Why would Jesus be the only way? And some of you might, might, might disagree. And some of you might argue saying, how is it that you are able to say that Jesus is the only way? Well, there's no one else on this earth who did what Jesus did for mankind. Like we said, the consequence of sin is death. Jesus is an historical character. He's not some cooked up story. The story of Jesus, the life of Jesus, is not some myth. It's not a mythology that we're talking about. He's an historical character. He came into this world for a particular purpose. In fact, world history is divided based on the birth of Jesus. As before, the, before Christ, before the birth of Christ, BC and AD, Anno Domini, in the year of the Lord perhaps after the death of Jesus Christ. That's how history is divided, which means the birth of Jesus is real. He was a real person who lived on this earth and who was born and the Bible says that he was sinless. He did not commit any crime. Some of you may have watched the Jesus movie or maybe you may have watched The Passion of Christ. You will understand that Jesus went about doing good. There was no sin in him. Leave alone, I mean, even if you don't believe in the Bible, secular historians who lived around the first century, Roman historians and Jewish historians, have mentioned about Jesus, have made a mention of Jesus. Everything that is recorded in the Bible is an historical fact. Pontius Pilate, who lived around the time of Jesus and passed that judgment and convicted Jesus of, uh, or, or, to be killed. I mean, all of those people, Herod, every one of them were real people. And, the, and those secular historians have recorded that there was a man who lived by the name Jesus and he did good for people and yet he was crucified on the cross. Pontius Pilate said, I don't find any fault in this man. The Jewish people who came to accuse Jesus, in fact, could not find any fault with Jesus and therefore they, they picked up some false witnesses. The Roman soldier who actually crucified Jesus stood back and said, there was no fault in this man. So Jesus, though he only did good for people and did not have any sin in him, he was not born in the natural manner. He was born of a virgin and therefore he did not have that sinful nature. And so this Jesus who did not have any sin in him decided to pay the wages of sin which is death and he said, I will take that penalty upon myself and therefore he was crucified on the cross. And he rose again from the dead on the third day. His tomb is empty even till today in the nation of Israel. And therefore Jesus is able to make that unique claim and say, I am the way, the truth and the life. And so in John chapter 3 and verse 16 it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In Romans 10 and verse 9 we say it, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in Him, you shall be saved. And John 3.16 says, Whoever believes in Him, no matter who you are, no matter 
how many sins you've committed, no matter how, how messed up your life is. The choice is yours. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and confess your sins and accept Him into your heart as, as your Lord and Savior and ask Him for forgiveness, Jesus is able to forgive you and deliver you from this problem of sin. So what is the result of salvation? I mean, you're able to receive salvation through Jesus Christ. That's what it says. So what is the result of salvation? Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the problem that the first human beings, Adam and Eve, faced and ever since mankind has faced is this break in this relationship with God because of sin. Now mankind seems to be trying various ways of trying to restore that relationship. We sometimes offer sacrifices of animals. We sometimes do good deeds, charity. I mean, you do a lot of other things. Penance, you try to inflict pain on your own body. But the Bible says you don't have to do any of these things because Jesus took up all of that pain on the cross. All that you need to do is to believe in Him. And so when you believe in Him, the result of salvation, the result of believing in Jesus is this. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ. That relationship that was broken between mankind and, and God is restored through Jesus Christ. So the choice is yours. It's an important choice. It is a choice that has eternal consequences and it is a choice that you need to make while you still have the time and while, you still, while you're still alive because after you are dead, you cannot make this choice. So you, can, you could make that choice right now. There are many simple choices we make. There are places that say, Off, offer uh, only till stocks last. Hurry, make the choice. I mean, there are shops that have uh, uh, discount sales and stuff like that and we quickly take up that message and we act on it and we hurry to those shops. This is not something like that. This is a much more important choice, my friend. And you need to make that choice at the earliest. If you watched the Jesus movie and if you read the Bible, it will tell you about how two criminals were crucified on the cross on either side of Jesus. They were real criminals. They had committed offenses. They had, uh, they had committed murder or something that was worthy of death. And yet there was Jesus in the middle of them who had committed no crime and yet was being crucified. In those last few moments before death, one of those criminals chooses to make fun of Jesus and mocks him saying, you saved others, couldn't you save yourself? And yet there was this other man on, this, on the right side, on the, on the other side who said, who realized that this Jesus who was on the cross had committed no crime. He was a sinless man. He was such a holy man. And that he was, he realized that he was the son of God and that he was able to give him access into heaven. And so he looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, remember me in your kingdom. And immediately Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. And he made such a wonderful choice in those last few moments before he could die. You and I don't have to wait until those last few moments. You don't have to wait until you die, until you come to your deathbed. You can make that choice right now, whether you choose the broad way that leads to destruction or the narrow way that leads to life. And that narrow way is Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. If you choose Jesus tonight, you can have eternal life in heaven with Jesus. God bless you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray for people who are confused about various choices that they need to make. This is one of those important choices. I pray that you would help them to be able to make the right choice, to choose the narrow path that leads to life, to choose you who came down to this world to give us eternal life, who died on the cross having committed no sin, yet you were willing to pay that penalty for sin so that we human beings could be delivered and so that we could be restored back to you. Through Jesus Christ, we can have peace with God. I pray that you'd help those watching to be able to make that choice which has an eternal consequence to choose you and to accept you into their hearts and to receive eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray.